This is Duke University. I'm supposed to give a little heads up sign for the, for the recorder, so hopefully that was enough of a heads up. Thank you all for being here. I really um, appreciate it, and uh, it has been an absolutely amazing weekend. So thank you all for that. Um, as I started out yesterday, I do want to say on behalf of the Alumni Association that we are so grateful um, that you were here and that you participated in our Winning Women's Weekend. As you know, this is a biennial event. Um, supplemented by multiple uh, um, women's forums events around the country throughout the year. Uh, we started out this weekend with 10 women's forums uh, throughout the states and in London, and now we have 12. So it has actually <laughs> been a quite, quite productive weekend in, in, in many ways, including increasing our programming. So, but again, I want to thank you. Did I say who I was? I'm sorry. I'm Sterling Wilder, class of 83. Oh my goodness. And the, dire and the Director of Alumni Affairs. And again, I just can't thank you all enough um, for everything. And we're looking forward to our panel this afternoon. Um, as many of you know, President Emerita Nan Cohan was to be with us um, this evening and she uh, was ill and unable to attend. She is much better as Bob Cohan has emailed us. And as a matter of fact, she was able to watch the game this afternoon, so we know that, that she is better. But, and now she's really better because we won. So, um, But we are um, sad that she's not here, but we are so delighted that Nancy Andrews, dean of the medical school, was able to join us in the conversation this afternoon. So my duty is almost over, and I am to um, introduce Donna Lisker, our fabulous moderator, and turn the program over to her. And as many of you know, Donna Lisker is the Associate Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education. And in her role, she focuses on integrating the academic and social dimensions of the student experience. Uh, Donna is a former director of the Women's Center and co-director of the Baldwin Scholars Program with Colleen Scott, who is with us today since 2004. And Donna also served on the Women's Initiative Steering Committee, um, which led a year-long analysis in 2002 and 2003 on the status of women on campus. An avid master rower, uh, Donna also teaches a freshman seminar on gender and sports in contemporary America. Donna, I turn the program over to you. Thank you, thank you. I feel like this has been perhaps the greatest Two days of my life, I got to facilitate a panel between Ellie Smeal and Nancy Hogshead yesterday, and now I have the honor of doing this with Dick Broadhead and Nancy Andrews, so um, it's terrific. And I was saying to Nancy how fortunate we are that on the one hand, we hate that Nan Cohan couldn't come, but on the other hand, look at the incredibly distinguished woman that we have available at a moment's notice to step in. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, President Broadhead, just very briefly, because I think you all know him, and he asked for the honor of introducing Dean Andrews, so we're going to let him do that, and then we'll begin with some questions. So Richard Broadhead became Duke's ninth president on July 1, 2004, after a 32-year career at Yale University. In addition to serving as president, he's a professor of English at Duke. He was born in Dayton, Ohio, and graduated from Yale in 1968, and received his PhD there in 1972. He then joined the Yale faculty, where he became the A. Bartlett Giamatti Professor of English and American Studies. After serving as chair of Yale's Department of English for six years, he was named dean of Yale College in 1993 and served in the post for 11 years until he assumed Duke's presidency. Dick? Oh. <laughs> now you can tell Spani. Well, Spania. all right. Okay. <laughs> and now I get the honor of introducing Nancy. Uh, and I'll introduce Nancy one way by saying, we got the news of Nan's uh, illness and unavailability, if I remember right, on Thursday morning at about 8.30. Well, the Women's Weekend was just about to begin, uh, right? This is called winning women. Uh, this was not going to be a winner to have an empty seat up here, so who are you going to call? Uh, I, I, I thought uh, the one thing that would be, I knew that Lori uh, Patton was already speaking on the program, uh, that let's, let's give a try, and you know, you have to assume, she's the dean of the medical school, that this is not going to work out. Uh, but actually, I, we, I wrote her, and by 10, by 10 a.m., you had already agreed uh, and said, I'm not doing anything, so that would be perfect. Uh, <laughs> all right, so as far as I'm concerned, you need know nothing else about her. But I will tell you one or two things about her, okay? She also went to Yale, 
Uh, she then went uh, to Harvard MIT uh, uh, I, uh, to the MD PhD program. I think, is it technically true that your PhD is from MIT and your MD is from Harvard? Yes. Uh, her, uh, she, she trained as a pediatric oncologist uh, and then uh, through her research, she has become uh, one of the principal experts, or I've even heard people say the principal expert in the world on how the body takes up iron, iron and all the complexes of diseases that are related uh, to that and the malfunction of that process. The iron lady, you are often called. <laughs> Yes, uh, and uh, she then became, uh, you know, at a tender age, uh, she became a chaired professor at Harvard Medical School. Uh, she, became, she was asked uh, to repair the MD-PhD program at Harvard M uh, MIT, which had fallen in, apparently, uh, they never got over your graduating, apparently, <laughs> uh, and you came back and fixed that. She then became the dean for basic sciences at Harvard Medical School, uh, and when Sandy Williams uh, uh, made other plans, we needed a dean for the medical school. We ran a search. We looked high and low. We looked at men and women. Uh, the, we asked ourselves the only question one can truly ask in a search, which is you want to make sure that you've done everything you can to have a diverse pool of candidates, but at the end of the day, you have to hire the person who's going to do the best job. Uh, and uh, what a, a pleasure it was that that person was Nancy Andrews, that she, uh, in fact, accepted the job, I think, uh, with uh, great spirit and enthusiasm. This enabled Duke to become the first top 10 medical school in America to have a woman as its dean. Uh, and only now am I in the position, is my research complete, that enables me to say, I've been told there are only two schools in the top 25 medical schools that have had a woman dean, and the other one is a graduate of Duke. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so it's all so it's all good. We still have a we still have a lock on it. Uh, Nancy came here uh, in the fall of 2007, if I re if I remember right about about that. Uh, she's uh, 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 you know the faculty of the medical school is huge, uh, and they have very high standards for things. They're not the easiest group to please. Uh, but I remember the gathering when you were introduced. Uh, she walked into the Searle Center uh, and she said something about Duke that I personally have quoted many times. You said how happy you were to come to a university that was inspired by its traditions but not determined by them, right? Okay, and I thought, that's a pretty good description of this place. This person seems like she gets it. Uh, since then, you have been a wonderful dean. Uh, 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 you've, you've led this place on all of its fronts, the, uh, the, the research front, uh, of course, where you are yourself such a leader. Uh, we're now building the first new building for medical education to be built since 1930, and that, I think, is a very uh, a significant part of your uh, personal leadership. In that building, doctors, nurses, PAs, and all the other things we teach will all be taught together rather than being all broken up and hierarchicalized the way they usually have been, and I think that's part of your mark as well. Uh, uh, everyone who's dealt with Nancy knows that she brings just extraordinary human warmth and cheer cheerfulness and effectiveness uh, to the occasion. You are the Iron Lady in that you bring extraordinary strength to an extraordinarily demanding job, uh, and yet, for all that, you bring all the compassion and respect and joy that one could wish. Uh, one last thing I'll tell you about her. Well, you, well in addition to serving on uh, Victor Zhao's councils in every respect, because, uh, of course, it's a big uh, position in the uh, whole of Duke Medicine, Nancy also has agreed to sit on my senior leadership team, and uh, that's actually been a great, great benefit. Actually, Lori Patton has, uh, has, has as well. Uh, but I'll just say one last thing about her. Uh, I remember taking you to your first Duke basketball game. Uh, and uh, uh, do you remember this? Of course I you do. do. Yeah. Who, how could we ever forget it, either of us? Uh, and I remember meeting your daughter on that occasion. Uh, well, she was in high school, and how, what was, was going to work out there. Uh, she herself is now a junior? Sophomore. sophomore. Okay, a sophomore at Duke. Uh, we might or might not hear a little more about that later on. Uh, but uh, uh, Dean Andrews is wearing her proud Duke mom pin. Uh, uh, and so we, this, this really, just, it just goes on and on and on. Uh, just, I am just, I am delighted to have you as a colleague. I've done many things professionally and personally with you, uh, always with the greatest of pleasure. And just, it's, it's great to have you come and join this event. Thank you very much.
so Nancy, I'm going to start with you. Um, Dick said that in 2007, when you were appointed, you were the first woman to be appointed to uh, be the dean of a top 10 medical school. And I remember hearing an interview with you on our local NPR affiliate in which this was pointed out. And you said very gracefully, but in essence, well, it's about time right, <laughs> that this happened. Um, and I, I guess I want to ask about that. It did take a long time, even, you know, despite the fact that you and many other women have had very distinguished careers in, as scientists and <clears throat> physicians. Um, when we did the Women's Initiative 10 years ago, we really were looking at the kind of subtle, hidden discrimination. We were happy to say that we'd gotten to the point where some of the more overt forms of discrimination had, had faded, but we found a lot of the, the subtler points still pressing on us. And I wonder if you would talk a little bit about how you've noticed that, if you have, in your own career and also as dean. Yes, uh, so without question, I've, I've noticed it in my own career. Things have changed a lot in the, I guess, um, going on 30 years that I've been in medicine. And um, I, I remember it was probably 1999, and you can likely correct me on this, but when MIT um, came out with a report about women at that institution. Uh, and I remember reading in the newspaper about that report and was tremendously moved because for the first time I had, um, I realized that it wasn't just me, that all of these mm -hmm. things that I thought were happening around me, places where I had felt um, disadvantaged and I thought maybe this is because I'm a woman, but you never know, it's subjective and it, it's usually little things that, that add up and compound. And reading that report um, was just amazing for me because I realized for the first time that um, women scientists at MIT had experiences that were very similar to what I had, had gone through. Mm -hmm. um, I think things have changed since then, that was certainly uh, a sort of a tsunami for MIT, and, and I think that it has markedly changed their culture and the culture of other universities. But um, I do think that we still have a lot of, um, of areas where women are disadvantaged. Uh, I think medicine and biomedical science um, is still, still has a very um, strong male influence. Uh, at, there was a time in my life when I was always the only woman at meetings. Uh, now there are usually two or three for, mm -hmm. for some of the more serious meetings. Um, but I know that uh, within our institution, within the School of Medicine, um, there are still areas where it's very difficult for women. Mm -hmm. So we have this year, I can hardly believe it, but we are hitting the decade mark since the Women's Initiative was initiated in, in 2002. And in that decade, the landscape at Duke has changed a great deal. So I was hoping Dick would comment on accomplishments and changes that you would point to that have happened in that decade. Happily so. Uh, the Women's Initiative was a remarkable thing to do. Now, the study at MIT that you pointed out, which I think that took place when Chuck Vest was president, yes, isn't that it. right? Uh, and it documented, just as you say, because the point was, it wasn't that the institution refused to hire women, but if women systematically have smaller lab spaces than men, for instance, or uh, less access to certain kinds of support, uh, well, you know, it's hard to get as far if you don't have certain kinds of support. It's hard to be as big if you don't have as much space, you know? Uh, and so that was really, a, it, it was important, I think, for teaching us all that you had to look at all kinds of relevant dimensions besides the obvious ones. Well, here's Nancy uh, Allen, whose job it is to do this on behalf of this university. Uh, the Women's Initiative came out, if I remember, in about October or November of 2003. Mm -hmm. And I remember it pretty well uh, because it got a lot of national coverage and it was smack in the middle of the presidential search. Uh, I read the Women's Initiative when I was a candidate for this job. Uh, and it was a striking thing to learn about this university that it had uh, cared to undertake such a study. Uh, the point of it was, as I think, you, as I think uh, uh, Donna emphasizes, it was it, 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 when you get past the phase of crude and overt discrimination, you get to the phase where you have to pay attention to often unintended intentional, uh, often almost invisible forms of discrimination. And what was so interesting about that initiative is it's, it thought that there might be issues that are women's issues all across the campus, but it also understood that they're going to be different sector by sector. Uh, uh, adjustments to the tenure clock are only of issue for people who actually have faculty appointments, right? 
Uh, child care is actually typically not an issue for undergraduates. Uh, the, issue, the, the issue of, of what encourages and discourages uh, uh, people in the form of PhD mentoring is a graduate student issue uh, more, more than it is other kinds of things. And I thought that that report was important uh, for giving each of these sectors the force of a united analysis while also understanding that each of them needed a different path of solution to solve its problems. Uh, so what came in the wake of that? Well, the first move that was made was the child care move, right? Because Duke uh, opened its own first child care center and then put out money uh, so that uh, all across Durham, uh, uh, child care institutions, we didn't want everybody from Duke to go to a Duke place. That, that actually is very bad for your city. Uh, so the thought was, put money out that enables local uh, 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 daycare institutions to make themselves better, to get five-star certification. Uh, on, and we'd put out the money to achieve that on the condition that they would then make uh, places for children of Duke employees uh, uh, and families there. So that was a very important thing. And really, sector by sector by sector, you had these, you had these di uh, different kinds of moves. Uh, everyone knows that one phrase leapt to fame from that report. Everyone knows what that phrase was, uh, effortless perfection. Uh, and I think that that was seen as the notion that one has to try as hard as anybody else while being under the further burden of never appearing to be trying, right? Uh, so you have to, I mean, you, you remember the details. You probably wrote it, I, I did. That, that, part, yeah, I did. that part of the report. <laughs> I did. Uh, so, and, and we have really kind of kept track of this sec, you know, sector by sector and year, year by year. Uh, if I were to list some of the things that I think have been very uh, important recent accomplishments, you know, all right, the, the percent of women on the faculty, which at that time was about 28%, is now about 38%. So that's a pretty significant change. It's, it doesn't happen in positions aren't all empty in a year, uh, but, but that continual change. Uh, when that report came out, Duke had three women dean, a dean of nursing, the dean of the law school, Kate Bartlett, and the dean of engineering, uh, Christina Johnson. Uh, but since then, we have had our first dean of medicine to be a woman. Uh, we, and now, uh, the, you know, the, the two biggest schools at Duke are arts and sciences and medicine. Uh, and uh, it has, I think, been a very significant thing that when we hired the best person for those jobs in the last few years, they both ended up being filled by women. That's been a very important thing. Uh, our new initiative in innovation and entrepreneurship, the person we chose to be its leader is the person well known to you, Kimberly Jenkins, who stepped off the board of trustees uh, in order to, uh, uh, to, to lead that initiative that's been so important to us all. I do want to say one thing, which is I think we always understood that there was one problem about the women's initiative, which is it acted as if women's problems are women's problems and the solutions to them have to do with things for women. Uh, uh, well, anything called a women's problem is a problem of men and women, and the, solu the solution needed to include, the, the diagnosis needed to include men and the solution needed to include men. Uh, and I think finding, especially is that true for the residential part of the, pop the, pop the population, it seems, uh, it seems to me. There's, there's one other thing I'd say, which is I think it was widely misunderstood when that report came out that what it said about undergraduates was a description of that moment, 2003, going forward. Remember what we all learned from that report? It was documented that men came with moderate self-esteem, which increased over their time at Duke, but that women came with moderate self-esteem, which decreased over their time at Duke. This is, of course, is an extraordinarily depressing statistic and significant one. Uh, what not everybody understood is that, that that factored in not just the experiences of that time, but the experiences of students since when women's college had been dissolved into the university. Uh, actually, I think it, has, it, it really came as quite a surprise when we did the study again to find that that actually isn't, uh, isn't true. Uh, and, and Donna, I, I th think you may agree with me. We actually had a problem, which is during the years when that, when that fact would be repeated to women, it would have the effect of suddenly lowering your self-esteem, <laughs> uh, but if in fact the group you're in is not is actually suffer is actually experiencing increased self-esteem as well, that's a good thing to know. Self-esteem is a funny thing, you know. Uh, I remember when you and I were first uh, doing this business together, Donna. Uh, we'd say, okay, what are we going to do about self-esteem? And we'd meet with groups of undergraduates, and, and they'd say, the first thing is, don't tell us that this is a problem because <laughs> uh, that makes it so it makes the problem so difficult. Uh, we I think there's you know really. Uh, it, 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 I, I know a phrase from the poet, the contemporary of Shakespeare, uh, uh, Edmund Spencer, endless work. 
solving the problem of making, what's, what's our aspiration here? Our aspiration is that this place will be in every position, staff, faculty, student, absolutely as open as an opportunity for any woman as for any man, and that when they come here, they will get just the same amount of opportunity, just the same belief in themselves to realize themselves and their education, uh, and that's endless work. Right? Uh, it's, it, it, it has to do with uh, uh, so many different issues. We've made very significant progress, uh, but of course that doesn't mean you're there yet. Thank you. So Nancy. Oh, I've left off the, oh, pardon oh. me. <laughs> Well, a very important thing in this regard is we're, uh, we have just acquired a property. It used to be a local children's school. It's actually quite near the Duke campus, which is very convenient. When Nancy first came, Nancy said, for any member of the faculty, staff, or graduate student, the, the main issue still is childcare. Remember you saying that? Uh, and that if you had some place you could go to at lunchtime, that would make a world of difference. Do you know where the Duke School None of us know how it got that name. Uh, uh, the Duke School is quite near Duke. Uh, uh, and actually, we've got that building, and it is being rehabbed right now. And in the fall, it will open 175 more spaces uh, for child care for Duke, uh, uh, for, for the children of Duke faculty and employees. That's I just actually want to the perfect segue, because I was going to ask Nancy a question. To, I was going to ask her to put on her dean hat and talk about um, uh, the fact that you now as dean see some of the most talented students and young faculty in the country who are coming to Duke to study or to work. So I'm interested in the ways in which you ensure that the climate is as productive and fruitful and equitable for them. It sounds like child care is at the top of the agenda, which is a wonderful thing. But you know, what do you do in recruitment, in development, in assessment that helps make the medical school climate as good as it can be? Well, because we are so big, we have nearly 2,000 faculty members, and we have um, about 2,000. <laughs> <laughs> it's big. About 2,000 learners. Um, it's very hard to do uh, much from centrally that that really has an impact uh, for people in many different environments. Mm -hmm. And um, someone told me, and I, I've not actually counted for myself, but I, I think this is probably right that we have faculty and students in 90, 90 buildings around Durham. And so there are a lot of local environments. There are clinicians, there are scientists, there are educators. Um, so it's, it's very hard centrally to uh, wave a magic wand and have everything be perfect. But the kinds of things that we have been doing include um, bringing in women leaders, um, we have, I recruited 10 uh, department chairs since I arrived at Duke. We have 20 departments, and three of those are women. Uh, for a while it was 50%, and then the most recent um, two were men. But um, right now, 50% of our faculty members have a woman department chair because our largest department, Department of Medicine, that has something like 600 or so faculty members um, has as its chair, Mary Klotman, who was a Duke undergraduate, Duke medical student, and uh, Duke house officer before she left for about 15 and varsity, years. And varsity athlete. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. um, and Mary is tremendous. And, and uh, she is, so I'm the one of two, I guess, I'm the only woman dean in the top 10, one of two in the top 25. Um, Mary is the only woman chair of medicine in at least the top 25. I was trying to figure out where the next one was, and after 25, it was just too much work, and so I stopped, but at least the top 25. And our chair of psychiatry, Holly Listenby, also a Trinity College graduate, Duke Medical graduate, Duke House officer, chairs uh, one of our next biggest departments, psychiatry, which has about 300 faculty members. Um, and then we also have women chairs in two other departments. I think that that uh, helps. Um, but one of the striking lessons to me in this job is that having women leaders doesn't get you there all the way. And so um, among other things, I've pushed hard for all of our department chairs, center and institute directors, um, to be very deliberate about trying to diversify uh, our faculty and our students and our other trainees, our residents and fellows. Um, and I've made this real to them by having 
uh, diversity and having a, a good plan for diversity as one of their annual metrics that um, their part. salary depends on in part. That's true. Uh, and, and so it's been noticed. Um, I've also, so, and I think that they have been quite responsive. Uh, as far as I can tell, all of them want more women and want to do the right thing. It's just not all um, know exactly how to get there. And so part of trying to get there has been appointing our first chief diversity officer, Judy Seidenstein, who we borrowed from um, the main campus. And uh, she, she is spending 100% of her time um, working on uh, first understanding our, um, our culture and our climate and finding out where the issues are and then uh, working with the local leaders, working with focus groups of faculty and students to try to um, find ways to, to make the environment better. So I think that um, some of it is deliberately bringing in, as Dick said, the very best people, but having uh, a substantial fraction of them be women. Mm -hmm. And some of it is making sure that we have um, the kind of school that will uh, help us retain people who, uh, women and people from um, other, who represent other kinds of diversity in many ways for us. Um, make sure we can retain them and have them feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Dick, you talked about how you read the Women's Initiative Report when you were being recruited. And um, Duke did get a lot of credit for having been willing to put ourselves out there with that report at the same time that we opened ourselves up for criticism for some of the things that were found. And I think as an institution, we haven't shied away from that dynamic about asking difficult questions and then um, taking the hit that results at times. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts on how we manage when you're talking about difference in identity and these sensitive issues in a world that has changed so much in terms of Twitter and blogging and YouTube and, you know, the... Are, the, you, re are you really going to ask me this question? I am. <laughs> I am. <laughs> Better you than me. <laughs> well, okay, I'm making eye contact with Judy, uh, Judy Woodruff. Uh, she is uh, one of the... Uh, noble persons in the press, uh, and in her presence, I have to say uh, that the free flow and free access to information is one of the features of every uh, great and enlightened civilization. Uh, at the same time, let's let, let's be frank. Uh, dealing with problems of a community or a culture is very significantly aggravated in the world of high publicity that we live in now. Uh, the world, the, uh, the 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 world of information is one thing. The world of publicity is another. Uh, and you know, we all we all know that the thing about publicity is there's maxi headline. That there's there's a story that goes on week after week after week. Uh, once something is a headline, I think we all have to understand. The world of headlines is the world of simplification and the world that invites preconceptions and plays to preconceptions. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's to say, it just seems to me publicity is, it's, it's, it's a source of information, but publicity in that sense of the word is the natural enemy of trying to understand problems in their complexity and achieve complex solutions. Uh, I'll, 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 you know, I've been through a case or two of, that involves, uh, has involved <laughs> publicity. Has the, has the problem been made easier to solve by the fact that everybody in the world knows the truth about everything, and especially to the extent that they actually know not a single true thing about it. Uh, you know, that's a, it's, a, it's a trick. Uh, and you know, the, the trouble is, uh, the, the trouble with being an excellent university is everybody admires you, and therefore everybody particularly enjoys knowing awful things about you. Uh, you, know, you know that this is true, right? Uh, this is the, the, uh, the curse, the celebrity curse. Uh, I don't want to be a, I want to be an excellent university, I don't want to be a celebrity university. But if you are an excellent university, you are a celebrity university. And so all the ills of celebrity come along. Uh, I, uh, I hesitate to go into it, uh, not to go back several years, but even last year, uh, a Duke student did something that I think you would say was profoundly indiscreet uh, uh, to, to offer no more of a view about that. 
uh, uh, this was sent in the form of something I'm sure considered to be quite witty uh, to another person. But of course, the, we, the, the world we live in, nothing can be guaranteed to be a private communication anymore. And so everyone can, you know, people take pictures of themselves doing things I was not encouraged either to do or take <laughs> pictures of in my childhood. Uh, but in such a world, the fact that everybody has a recorded everything and that then it gets sent to somebody or everybody, and you don't know which. Uh, so look, look at the pains this place went through last year because that was our culture, right? But on the other hand, what an absurdity to think that something no one has ever done before in history, in what way was that representative? And yet somehow, not only was the world informed about it, I mean, you know, I would go to Seattle, I would go to Singapore, and people would ask me about this. Uh, but not only that, but we ourselves then ended up analyzing ourselves in terms of this incident. Uh, I, I'm telling you, if you want to work on these problems, publicity in that sense is not your friend. Uh, and so you have to handle it as best you can, and you have to try to remember that actually you've got to propose your own more complicated internal understanding and ask people to work in a more complicated way for internal solutions. Now what came out of that last year was actually quite an interesting thing, which is uh, that then came up a series of stories about fraternity parties uh, and then actually sorority leaders on campus did that which had not, well actually the Baldwin scholars had done it in their first year, which is to step, step forward and say we're not participating in these things. Uh, you know this actually has a profound effect. Uh, uh, if you refuse to do things that people then belittle you for doing, that's actually a pretty strong position to take. Uh, and, and look, at the, the pushback, it seemed to me, was really wonderful for the health of this community, wonderful for the reputation of this community, and wonderful for the self-confidence of women as self-determining agents. Mm -hmm. Great. I want to ask one more question, the same question of both of you, before, in order to leave a little bit of time anyway for questions. So, one of the primary things we're celebrating this weekend is the 40th anniversary of Title IX, which is a significant amount of time, 40 years, but it's also, of course, just the blink of an eye in other, in other ways. And I've heard so many alumni this weekend talking about how their time here at Duke just seems like yesterday, but um, so much has changed in that way. I'm interested in, in that 40-year period since Title IX, what you might be particularly proud of, you know, what you think has changed so much for the better, and what areas you still think we need to be working towards and, and working on in support of women's leadership. Um, Go ahead. Your well, turn. I think that just the fact that there are women leaders in places where uh, it when I was young, it would never have occurred to me there could be a woman leader. It just wasn't something I could imagine. Uh, I think is a tremendous accomplishment. At the same time, at least in medicine, the progress has been very, very slow. Uh, a colleague of mine, actually a man from another medical school, a couple of years ago projected out how long it would take until we reached in medicine, in academic medicine, parity between men and women at assistant professor, associate professor, full professor levels. And um, I don't remember all of the numbers, but associate professor was going to be 2038, mm -hmm. and full professor was going to be 2058 if things continued along mm -hmm. the same path that they'd been. Um, I think that we're actually going to get there faster, because I, I think there is a critical mass effect, and we are the the slope of that curve has changed over the last few years. But I do worry because in tough times and now in tough economic times, I think there's a tendency to move back to what's secure. And um, I wonder, I, I started at Duke um, about, depending on how you count it, about nine months or so before the economy crashed. And um, I can't help but wonder if things had continued to be relatively easy, relatively good times, right. uh, if there would not by now be another woman dean of a top 10 medical school. Mm -hmm. Several of the uh, other schools have had their deans turn over, um, which actually should happen often because the average tenure for a medical school dean is three years. Oh. So I've passed the We've already, average. We're very, we're very happy about that. <laughs> Nancy's a survivor. <laughs> It was two years for a long time, and now it's three. Um, <laughs> but, but I think I do see um, in, in many areas what looks like a, a slip backwards, 
And I think it's because people um, become more conservative and, and fall back into old patterns in tough times. And so um, a couple of years ago, I was a lot more optimistic that we were changing our trajectory and getting there faster. I'm not so sure now. And I think it takes a lot of, uh, of deliberate effort. Same question, Dick. Okay. Well, uh, we should talk about Title IX and athletics at some point because sure. actually, that's it's been such, a, such, an, such an important part. But I won't say that now. You you asked about achievements in the future. You know, when you talk about medicine, you're talking about a field that is very paradoxical, in that women got MDS far earlier than they got many other professional degrees. And actually, the profession, like biomedical sciences, has always had lots of women in it, uh, and medical faculties. I mean, compare them to physics departments, compare them to economics departments, it's actually always been very welcoming, and there's always been a, a, an abundant presence of women. But then, the higher you get in the hierarchy, the less you find them. Uh, and why is that? Partly it's because it has had, it's been the place that really had the alpha male culture, that was part of it. Uh, part of it is something that no one has mentioned, maybe because it's too obvious, which is that as women have assumed uh, uh, the freedoms of professional identities, they typically also continue to bear the traditional burdens uh, of family, child rearing, not exclusively, but disproportionately they do. Uh, and those things become that, you know, if you have that responsibility, that's going to have some effect on, on your degree of, of advancement. We haven't wanted to create the, the world in which women will become suddenly equal to men on the condition that they don't care about families, right? I mean, that's, that's actually not a solution to the problem. That's, 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 that's a pseudo-solution, or, or that's a solution that, that simply is the new problem. Uh, so, so, so we have to keep all these things in mind. We don't want to make the problem s s simpler than, than it actually is. I'll tell you, when I think about where we are, you know, I went to, okay, okay you want to know something that uh, you may already know, and if not, I hope it won't make you hate me. Uh, do, you, do you know that I graduated from an all-male college? Okay. I graduated from an all-male college in the year it announced it would admit women. Four years later, I was a faculty member at that college, and it had already been co-educated for two years. So that's to say, I never taught, an, uh, I never attended a class with a woman when I was in college, and I never taught a class without a woman the, uh, in the 32 years I was on the, fac the faculty of that place. So like, I've seen it both ways, and so I think Cindy and I, you know, uh, when I went to graduate school, that was so amazing. It was co-educated, you know? Uh, uh, that had many advantages and fascinations, uh, but, uh, uh, but really, you know, my life, it really was lived by, I came to adulthood with the women's revolution, uh, as also with the civil rights revolution in this country. And for me, that has been one of the profoundly meaningful facts of my life. But then the question was, how do you open the doors? How do you remove the overt barriers of discrimination that used to pertain? When I was at Yale, the first Title IX, one of the very famous Title IX cases, uh, uh, Yale had men's and women's crew after it was co-educated. Uh, and the men's crew, uh, they had to go about 12 miles to a place where you rode. And you know, it's often quite cold and, and and damp went in New England uh, in the spring. Uh, and the men had a shower, uh, and the women didn't. So the women had to wait on the bus in their sweaty sweatsuits, waiting for the men to finish showering so they could get back in the bus and go back to New Haven, where the women could then shower. Uh, the women, actually, one of them was my student. She wrote in the Olympics, Chris Ernst, I'm Ernst, sure you know yep, who she is. She's a wonderful documentary. Uh, she led a very famous uh, protest in which the women members of the crew went into the office of the then director of athletics, who was a woman, uh, and took their clothes off uh, to, pro uh, to draw attention to this inequity. Uh, and you know something? Uh, actually, that was, that, okay, so only in 1999 did they discover that women had minuscule labs at MIT. You know, these discoveries, you got to be hit over the head with a sledgehammer again and again and again. Uh, but we've, we, there has been progress on all those fronts. I'll tell you, we should look back with pride. We should look to the present with a sense of what our business is to accomplish now. But you know, the challenges of the future might be very different from those that we have now. Let me mention something that interests me. As you look at national unemployment figures, you're aware, I presume, that unemployment for men is significantly higher than unemployment for women. 
But if women are the ones who have the preponderance of, ch of child rearing and, and, and domestic responsibilities, uh, you know, you're making it harder and harder and harder if the woman has to earn, has, has to be more of the breadwinner for the family while also doing the other jobs. And here's the figure that I think should really give us pause. This isn't a Duke story, but it is an American story. Do you know the figures about the percent of women getting bachelor's degrees and the percent of men and women getting bachelor's degrees? Men outnumbered women until the year 1980, and then you achieved the happy moment of equality. But now, I think the figure I saw, 57% of the bachelor's degrees in America go to women, and 43% go to men. Now that's great as indicating uh, opportunity for women, but I would say it's potentially quite distressing uh, in terms of what's going to happen. What's going to happen for this country if you have an under uh, an undereducated world of men and the women still have the responsibility? So the women now have yet more responsibility financially while still having uh, a preponderance of responsibility on the domestic side. That's a problem that I think none of us have really begun to prepare yet uh, for for yet. Uh, but but that's something we could maybe see. What isn't there something? about a cloud on the horizon no bigger than a man's hand. Uh, this is, or a woman's hand, this is, uh, this, this might be said to be one. We have so much experience and interest and passion in the room that I want to open it up for questions for a little while. We don't have microphones in here, so I'll ask people to, to project as they can, and I'll repeat the question if necessary. So what questions do we have? Yes, Judy. Um, so I think part of it is exposure, uh, hands-on science. I remember when my daughter, who is my oldest, uh, started doing science in school and didn't really like it. Um, I was thinking, that's not science at all. That's just you know sort of Mickey Mouse stuff, and it doesn't at all resemble what I think of as science. Um, I think also um, helping girls maintain um, their confidence. Now I realize I'm about to get into trouble if this is being recorded and my daughter ends up seeing it. <laughs> or if you won't tell her. It was on YouTube. Yeah. But um, <laughs> when my daughter was in middle school, like many middle school girls at, at that point and maybe still, um, she started, she'd always been great at math and she started to uh, do less and less well. And so I would tell her, um, you know, don't worry about that test or that quiz. You've always been good in math. And it, I think, I take credit for it, I think that that helped turn around at least her self-esteem about math. And, and she was great in math, and she continued to be after that. So when my son was in high school and he came home one day with uh, an unusual situation where he hadn't done well on a math test, um, he sort of looked at me and he said, well, Camille was always really good in math. And I realized that uh, He'd heard me say that to her over and over again, and I'd never said it to him. So, um, <laughs> and thus, the gender problem will be corrected. <laughs> so it's become kind of a family joke. But, um, but I think it is really important to, um, there are times one of the uh, characteristics of science, I think, is that um, you have to, you'll fail sometimes if you're asking tough questions, if you're trying to do uh, new and important things. You're not going to succeed all the time. And I think one of the things you need to learn is um, how to deal with when things don't go your way. And um, I don't know how early in school that starts, but I think preparing um, kids and girls in particular for um, realizing that when something doesn't work, you just move on and you try again and, and keep going. Um, and so I think that's also an important part of keeping people in. in, in my view, um, a lot of the reason why there is a leaky pipeline from you know, early on all the way through, at least in my field, all the way through to the most senior people in biomedical science um, is that women are more likely to opt out. If things aren't going well, they're more likely to say, you know, I've got another talent, I can go in a different direction. And so I think um, developing that resilience is also very important. I will say, too, that Dean Andrews has been so generous with her time. In the Baldwin Scholars Program, every time we ask her, will you talk to a group of young women about your career path and how you've gotten there, she always says yes. And this is a very busy woman, so the role modeling is important, too. Maybe I could just put in and say one little thing, which is to link what you just said to sports. 
Uh, I was not myself a varsity athlete. This may not be known to you. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, and so I'd have to say one of the things that I really came, that I didn't get right away about sports is that sports is about doing things and sometimes they go well, and sometimes they don't. But in sports, when something doesn't go well, like you miss a basket, you're not, you can't just you know, say, well, I'm going to leave the court now and do some, I, I, you know, <laughs> practice some alternate skill. Uh, this, this business of learning to try your best and then just erase what just happened, because now you've got to try your best over again, that's actually a great lesson. Yeah. Uh, and you know, sports is a place where people learn all kinds of skills that are valuable for, across the entire world of experience. That's, yes, that's why we have Title IX. Laurie? Yeah, thank you so much. This was really inspiring as always. And um, I wanted to ask a question about a theme that came up this afternoon in our lunch, which is about innovation. Um, so you may or may not know that in, to be an innovator originally meant to be a heretic, to be someone who departed from the theological norm. Huh. Um, and now, of course, it means someone whose idea has connected with society when I wanted to create a better story about arts and science patents, people who had registered for patents in the last uh, three or four years, um, there were hardly any women in that group. And there have been very interesting studies that show that people who register for patents, those kinds of innovators, inventors, um, aren't women. And it's, it's similar to the theme you were just talking about. But there have been other studies that suggest that social innovation new ways of connecting, new ways of relating and restructuring certain kinds of networks are um, more and more women. Uh, and I think that's just a very interesting fact that I'll share with everyone here. That's that, um, Arts and Sciences in the School of Medicine has uh, occasionally has episo episodic scrappiness around uh, classroom things, <laughs> around labs and so on. And we, Nancy and I decided we're just going to create a new network that involved a kind of oversight and collaboration. There were five women in that room and uh, when we first met in January, and there were about 10 years of problems that we solved in an hour. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, but I just would love to hear you talk about this question of what it means to innovate and invent for women. May I? Please, yeah. I'm going to um, sort of indirectly address that, but um, one of the things I feel very strongly, um, and you probably can sense this, about the importance of diversity for our school. And so I, I try to um, make that a part of, of uh, really every public um, opportunity I have to talk to the faculty. We had a symposium on innovation uh, about a month back. And so as part of that talk, um, I did some reading in the social sciences literature, uh, which is not my area, and so it's a little bit of a different language, but got pointed in the right direction and came across a really fascinating experiment. And if there are social scientists here, um, please forgive me for being a, a novice, but um, it was to uh, get a group of people together to come up with a solution to a problem. And what they did was they had a group of, I don't know how many, say 100, people in a field, and they um, made two smaller groups from those. They took something like 10 people who were the very best, considered the cream of the crop, and then they took 10 people randomly selected. And the innovative solution, the most innovative solutions, didn't come from those who were the best. It, uh, it came from the group that was randomly selected. Um, and in other <laughs> settings, so, so this was, uh, I think, is a very strong argument for diversity. And in another setting, and I can't find the reference for this, um, a, a colleague told me about a study where um, basically it showed that uh, when you have a group of people, you get the, the best dynamic, the most innovative, the most productive group when it's 50-50 men and women. And if you move towards all men or all women, um, the group doesn't come up with solutions in the same way and doesn't do as well. So it's not exactly answering what you're asking, but yeah. I, I think it's a strong argument that innovation um, requires all perspectives. It's, it's, it's a great answer. 
it, it, we, we know that there are cultural dimensions and cultural baggage to all these things. Uh, and you know that in traditional culture, innovation is marked as masculine. Uh, do you know a quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson? He who would be a man must be a nonconformist. <laughs> okay, well, what about she who must be a woman, who would be a woman? What is that, what's that exactly supposed to mean? Uh, and even now, you talked about social entrepreneurship. Uh, who is the most famous entrepreneur or an innovator in America? Steve Jobs. Who's the most famous social innovator in America? Perhaps Wendy Kopp. Okay, so you so you get it that way. Uh, but just 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 so as not to keep replicating that, the founder of Teach for America. Uh, so so as not to keep replicating that, I think that the fact that we uh, Duke put in charge of our innovation initiative and entrepreneurship initiative, Kimberly Jenkins, our graduate our former field hockey player, of course, uh, who, uh, who went to Microsoft and persuaded Bill Gates to found an, uh, the education practice that became their biggest growth industry for, for a decade, uh, to have her be the head of that initiative, I think, was ex it has been extraordinarily meaningful. You know, I'll tell you, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, when I became a faculty member, my department had had men as its chairs since the origination of the English language. <laughs> right? Uh, but, and you know, the experience was not altogether happy, but it was altogether expected. Uh, and I, uh, I remember, uh, uh, there's a person, uh, Pat Spax, you may know her name, Patricia Meyer Spax, became my boss. She became my department chair uh, when I was uh, a, fir a first a tenured member of the faculty. It made a very big difference to be in the world with, that, with, with, with different, uh, 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 different governance. Uh, and it seems to me uh, that to put people in charge of things they're expected to be in charge of, you know, we are very lucky that Catherine Gillis is the dean of our nursing school. But people expect the dean of the nursing school to be, to be a woman. I don't say anything to belittle that, uh, but to have people, to have women be in positions and excellent and fantastic at positions that they're not expected to be in actually does have a wonderful effect for everybody. You know, you don't, you don't have to keep teaching people lessons when it's right in front of you all day long. I think we have time for one more question. Yes. Yes. And, um, I, I'm very fortunate to be a cancer survivor from Duke Hospital, and I appreciate so much that good medical attention. And I Go wanted, ahead. as far as the females, I, if you could kind of break down um, a little bit for us in the cancer center um, the number of percentage of female um, doctors, male doctors, or yeah. how that sort of plays out. I don't know offhand. Um, I know that, uh, I, I don't know the numbers. I, I can think of many wonderful um, women doctors there, um, but I'm afraid I don't know the numbers. Um, it's right now the, the senior leadership of the Cancer Institute uh, is all men, something that I'm bugging them about. Um, <laughs> but there are gonna be some other, other positions that will be very important, but I know that we have, um, really amazing uh, women doctors in there as well. And will you, through the med school, be, um, I'm assuming, in deep communication with, with this cancer center? And absolutely. It's filled up with our faculty, and, and so absolutely. That's great. Before we close, Dick, maybe you want to say a little bit about athletics since we bookmarked that to come back to. <laughs> Did you want to say something about Title IX in athletics or call on Kevin to say something? Well, here's a funny thing. Anybody who's gone to Duke or to most American universities will think that higher education and athletics have a natural relation to each other. Actually, they don't. In most, country, in most other countries in the world, there aren't athletic programs. There aren't serious athletic programs as part of the university. Did you ever see anyone wearing Sorbonne sportswear? <laughs> Uh, if you go to universities in Germany, if you go to, it just, these, it doesn't, it doesn't happen. It's a, it's just an American peculiarity, but the funny thing about it is we bundle things together that it's very hard to express the conceptual relation, except they have a great experiential relation to one another in terms of spirit, in terms of whole life, whole, uh, whole person balance, things of that sort. Uh, but I'd have to say one of the profound lessons for me uh, of assuming a position of academic leadership, uh, first as dean and now as president, has been to learn that, uh, that, that athletics 
are not best understood as an extracurricular activity or letting off steam on the playground so, uh, before you come back in to study. They are profoundly educational. Done right, they undergird the development of fundamental skills that we take for granted that are actually better developed through athletics or as well or better through athletics than through academic pursuits alone. Uh, if we think of teamwork, uh, team, uh, the, you and I are humanists. Humanists don't practice teamwork, uh, but guess what? <laughs> actually, there are a lot of things you can't do if you don't learn teamwork. Uh, learning how to discipline yourself, how to deliver the highest level of performance, how to lose uh, and try just as hard the next, the, the next minute. These, these are things that you learn supremely from athletics. Uh, remember what the Duke of Wellington said about the, water, the Battle of Waterloo after, you remember he said uh, the, the defeat of Napoleon? The Battle of Waterloo was won on the playing fields of Eton, Eaton. he said. Uh, <laughs> and people think that means that sports is like uh, uh, military uh, uh, training, you know, mili military exercise waiting to happen. That's not what it meant at all. Uh, what it meant is it trained you in the fundamental disciplines that could then be used in another way later on. My favorite, you know, one of my favorite commercials on television, you know, I, I don't like all commercials, uh, some are <laughs> funny, uh, but my favorite one is the NCAA commercial that says, uh, uh, every year we have 400,000 students who go professional in something other than sports. It's fine that some of them go professional in sports. We're so proud of their achievement. And may I just say, when I think of the roster of people who've won individual national championships at Duke, I can actually think of one man recently, but I can think of three women in the last, uh, in the last two years. So that's fantastic. Uh, you know, but the truth is, uh, the, everywhere I go in this country, Mary Klotman, how astonishing, at the Cancer Center dedication, uh, the, 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 the chair of our Department of Medicine, the biggest, that has what, a thousand faculty members, or something. Feels like it. <laughs> Maybe it's 10,000 faculty members. Uh, that, uh, the, the fact that only there did I learn that she had been a field hockey player. I mean, but actually in Kimberly Jenkins, the, you know, before she uh, started bossing Bill Gates around, uh, she had been a varsity athlete. It's just, it's just, it's just you know, it's, it's, it's a lesson and it makes you understand uh, you get it wrong when you break athletics off and treat people as athletes and not as, pe treat, treat their athletic life as if it's separate from everything else, that's wrong both ways. But when you can put them together the right way, you get a, a yet richer education. Uh, and of course, you know, there wasn't, when I went to college, uh, women were not meant to exert themselves. Okay, you may remember hearing the, fr the phrase, horses sweat, men perspire, women glow. All right, uh, and that was the time when women's basketball, wasn't it, what was the rule? You were forbidden to take more than four steps before you had to pass the ball. Uh, left three, three steps. Well, that was, it, it probably had formerly been two steps uh, and had recently been liberalized. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, world, uh, what, the, the world in which women will excel in every form of professional activity is deeply rooted in the world in which women are encouraged to exert themselves uh, in, in teams and at the highest level of performance. It, it, it really, if you want that as a social phenomenon, you better look to athletics as one of the rich sources of, it, of, of the, the rich seed beds for it to grow in. This is such a wonderful conversation. I wish it could continue, but there is the athletics gala, so I think Surly is going to wrap us up here. I am going to wrap you up. Thank you. For yes, thank you. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.